is suicide ever morally justified? And then they have four subsets, and that's the first one we're going to cover tonight. Uh, and this is what they said. King Saul committed suicide so that he would not be abused by the Philistines. In addition, Saul was wounded at the point of death so that prolonging life was at least an inconvenience. Saul's armor bearer also took his own life probably because Saul did. Do you see how complicated? And that, that is not a question. That is a compound complex sentence uh, minimum. And then number two. Sub point two, I have read that Jewish women would take their own lives just to not be raped. Number three, Jesus said of Judas Iscariot, good for it if the man, if he had not been born, it would seem that suicide would have been preferable for Judas to betraying Jesus. And number four, uh, the Jewish occupants at Masada took their own lives rather than be conquered. So that is amazing. Uh, the, the central question, though, is this one. And I just want to begin by talking about... Um, why, why we're doing this tonight, why we're having a Q&A, because um, this, my purpose is to give you a biblical foundation from which you can make morally um, appropriate uh, decisions. But the bigger question is, is suicide biblical? And of course the answer is absolutely not uh, under any condition, and we'll go through that. But from that subset, we come into one of the challenges uh, of theology, and uh, that is what I would call, and what uh, Wayne Grudem calls, the more, the more bad versus the less bad choices. Um, and then, of course, within, uh, uh, and that's, of course, having to do with sins like suicide. And then you have the more good and versus the less good choices. Um, because, for example, um, you know, I, I mentioned, uh, I don't know what, last week, and someone said, well, does that mean that everything at such and such church is wrong because they have that? And I said, no, 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 no. No, no, you can have uh, more good and less good within a church. Let's say uh, they teach the word, uh, they have solid orthodox doctrine, but they have a woman pastor. By the way, woman and pastor are not to be connected because pastor is the word for elder and shepherd and always is defined in the Bible as a, a man's role. So you can't attach the title pastor to a woman for anything without creating confusion. But does that mean that everything within the context of that church is wrong? No, it's just we have to choose when we're making decisions, more good, less good. And, and what I would do is I would just keep working through what are all the positives and negatives and, and you decide where to go to church because there's no church that's perfect. There's no church that's absolutely right. There's no church that, I mean, even when the apostles were here, the churches couldn't agree on stuff. And there was conflict. So it's just a decision of more good and less good and the same with suicide. So let me just go through this lest we take all night. First defining, I just got out of Webster, uh, suicide. The act or instance of taking one's own life voluntarily and intentionally, especially by a person of years of discretion and of sound mind. I thought that was interesting that Webster would add that. And uh, so we're not talking here about valor. We're not talking about jumping on a grenade. Uh, we're not talking about the, the fireman that, that risks his life and loses it or the you know, uh, public safety policeman, whatever. We're not, we're, that isn't suicide. That's, that's something, a whole different realm. This is talking about someone who just says, uh, I'm too guilty, I'm too depressed, I'm so hopeless, it, I'm so dark, or whatever, I just can't take it anymore, and it's over. By the way, uh, for 15 to 49-year-olds, this is the number one cause of death. Did you know that? Uh, worldwide, suicide is number 10, globally. Uh, the 10th highest cause of death, and uh, right now, it, it fluctuates between 800,000 to a million people annually. So this is huge. 
Uh, this is what's frightening. This is the, the growing um, area. Uh, and especially, uh, what's interesting, this, you notice it goes to 49. Um, it, it just, uh, it's ramping up because a lot of the boomers are, they've done everything, tried everything, and they're coming up empty. And they're just saying ending life. But that's what suicide is. Let's talk about uh, biblical clarity. And this is just, I just wrote this down because um, I hear all the time that I couldn't take notes fast enough, you know, or you talk too fast. So I just wrote it down. Just the, this is just, these three are just whatever, whenever this question comes up, this is kind of the underpinning that we have to go through. Suicide is always sin. Whether it's Saul, Judas, Ahithophel, Zimri, or whoever. Suicide is always sin. Why? Because God says murder, the sixth commandment, of self or of others is always wrong. But then you go, why? Well, number one, because, number one, the big one is suicide is the sin of murder. God says you can't murder. Exodus twenty thirteen, the sixth command. Any disobedience of God is sin. So anytime God commands something, anytime God says, this is what my moral perfections demand, and we don't do it, it's sin. Now, there's a lot there. Um, when I get more into the disciplines, someone who can't stop eating is sinning too. Someone who can't stop buying is sinning too. There's a lot of sins. God says that we're supposed to, to obey him, and any disobedience is sin. But suicide is a very big one because it's murder. Number two, it's rebellion. Now think about who is the author of life? Who grants life? Suicide is a rebellion against the giver of life himself. And, and uh, since God alone is the giver and taker of life, suicide and murder intrude in a very unique way upon God. In fact, God treats murder in a little different way. It's interesting that though the, there are all sins lead to hell, sin, even one, makes us worthy of eternal judgment. Some sins have, have wider effects. In fact, immorality, God says, is very serious for believers, any form of immorality, because it's a sin that, it says all of their sins, Paul said in 1 Corinthians, all of their sins are outside the body, but any immoral sexual sin is against the body, which for a believer is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So that's, that's a differentiation in sin that, that uh, you know, impatience or, or cutting communication or lying or whatever, those are really bad. But immorality for a believer is set a little notch higher. Uh, murder, God says that, that the blood from murder cries out to him. And that's why in the Old Testament, it's interesting, whenever there was a murder, uh, they had to do a special, they had to measure how far the person's body was from the city, and they had to take a delegation out, and they had to do a special offering so that God would not hear the blood crying from the ground and send judgment. So, But it's a, it's a, a sin of rebellion because... Believers are repeatedly described as those who have hope. And, and now we're talking about not only is suicide wrong for unbelievers, it's really bad for a Christian. Why? Because the Bible says that what God has given to us is hope. And I'm, I'm glad for the pairing of the questions because when we get to the second question about trichotomy and dichotomy and monism and everything else that's implied there, um, we're going to talk about why believers could get to the place where they don't have any hope. And it is very real. I mean, in the last 12 months, um, you know, uh, what I forget his name, Rick Warren's son took his own life. I mean, in the last year. I mean, a man who, who has, and, and it's not, it's not uh, unusual for believers to lose hope. So we'll talk about that. It's a sin of rebellion, though, no matter who does it. And finally, suicide is um, 
is the sin of denial. Many suicides stem from some form of hopelessness or, or guilt. And not only are they rebelling against the, the God who is the giver of life and with life hope, but they're also denying that the Lord can give them hope and peace and forgiveness. Suicide denies God the opportunity to give hope and peace and the assurance of forgiveness. And so it's, it's in bad company. That's the best thing I could say about it, that suicide is in bad company. Okay, uh, the examples in uh, uh, Saul and his armor bearer, uh, which uh, was alluded to in the question, Ahithophel. Uh, he was the counselor uh, to David, and then when Absalom did his rebellion, Ahithophel and Hushai both give their, their counsel, and, and the Lord put Hushai in there to thwart Ahithophel's Ahithophel's counsel. Um, by the way, Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. Do you see why he wanted to get rid of David? He hated him for violating his granddaughter. Uh, so, uh, but Ahithophel gave good advice, which if had been followed by Absalom, David would have been finished off. But Hushai thwarted it, and Ahithophel's pride caused him to go and set his things in order and kill himself. Uh, and then Zimri, you know, the, the king who won um, in battle and then lost in battle, and then he committed suicide by burning the house over him. And then, of course, we know Judas. And it's interesting, uh, actually, these two are similar. Uh, this one, the guy was drunk and uh, an unbeliever. Judas was exposed to the truth. Ahithophel was exposed to the truth. Saul uh, probably was... Uh, I mean, he, he actually, um, you know, was mortally wounded, and, and then he asked that uh, um, Amalekite to kill him, and then when he did, the armor bearer killed him. So, so there's difference, though, between laying down your life uh, for another, which the Bible says, you know, greater love, John 15, Jesus said, greater love has no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friend, which is kind of the soldier on the grenade and the, the you know, emergency worker and taking one's own life because of fear or guilt. So going back to, uh, is it right, and, and I'll answer the subset, is it right to commit suicide so you don't get raped? No, it's not. Is it morally justifiable? What do you mean by morally justifiable? Are you saying that God would say, oh, it's okay? No, God is absolute and holy. I mean, was it right for the, the 960 or 70, however many they were on Masada, to kill themselves so the Romans wouldn't put them in slavery? No, it was not. But, I mean, it, people do things because of fear. They didn't want to be abused because of guilt, as in Judas, overwhelmed with killing the Son of God, as in Saul, you know, uh, knowing that, that he had contacted the witch and all that stuff, and Ahithophel, pride, Zimri, drunkenness, and and uh, foolishness, but there are biblical examples of suicide. Now, when suicide intersects with a believer, or when it intersects with, uh, in fact, if you want to read anything interesting uh, on this topic, because all of us are always looking for ways to, to help people, um, John Piper has every sermon I think he's ever preached online, and if you actually do a site search in Google within his site, you can find all of his sermons of people at Bethlehem Baptist Church that have committed suicide. I mean, sitting under his teaching, committed suicide. And his sermons are fascinating, um, how he delivers the gospel. But let me just summarize the theology behind uh, forgiveness. All sins are forgivable because for the believer, now, now I'm talking about a believer who is called out in faith and is clinging to Christ. At that instant, all sins, past, present, and future, have been placed upon Christ. Colossians 2.13 says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What that means is that all of our sins 2,000 years ago were nailed to the cross. That's, what, that's the biblical doctrine of salvation. Uh, Hebrews 10.14 says, by one sacrifice, one sacrifice forever. It's not like, oh, oh, there's a new sin. There's a big one. Oh, I better do something about that. Jesus Christ paid once and for all for all sins. We also know from Romans 8, the, the very famous uh, ending of Romans 8 there, that nothing can separate us from God's love, not even ourselves. See, that's part of where we get the, the 
the concept of the security of the believer. That, in fact, that was just a question I had in the, in the visitor line. Uh, you wonder, uh, it's amazing the questions that come. And one of the questions was, it was precious. They said, um, if Hebrews chapter 6 says that, that uh, it's impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have partaken of the heavenly calling, if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance. They said, how do we know we can't lose our salvation? And I said, well, you have to, you have to build it on doctrine. I said, um, the Bible calls being saved being born again. And Jesus said that we were born again not by the will of man, not according to us, but it's of God in John 3 when he was explaining it to Nicodemus. And I said, so when you were born, did you choose to be born? <laughs> I said, how did you get your, your it was uh, uh, a married woman. I said, how did you get your maiden name? You didn't choose it. God put you in that family. And I said, if you were born into God's family, you didn't do it. God did it. Salvation is of the Lord, Jonah 2.9. So how can you undo something God did? See, that's that's the 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 reason that there are people that think they lose their salvation is that they have an unbiblical view of how they got saved. They think they saved themselves. They think that by praying that prayer or by walking that aisle or by whatever they did, that they somehow saved themselves. But what salvation is presented in the Bible is responding to what God already has done. That yes, I, to be saved, I have to respond, but the initiator is God. And if, if God, the initiator, saves us, he as a part of the equation, has already paid the price for any sin we will ever commit. And so therefore, nothing that we do can separate us from God's love. God is able, as Jude says, the, the last uh, two verses of Jude are a doxology, and it says, now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. So eternal security, the assurance of eternal life to a believer, is not based on how hard, and, and you've heard the story many times about children when they're riding on their parent's shoulder are, are just holding on tight and it just tense as can be until they finally realize that their security on their parent's father's shoulder is not based on how hard they're holding, but the fact that he has them clamped down tight, you know, like this and won't let them, no matter how many gyrations they do, come off his shoulders. That's what salvation is like. It's not how hard we're holding on to Christ. It's how completely he is holding on to us. And so now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. And that's what that doxology talks about. God keeps us from falling. So that's a little biblical clarity. But we do have to balance that with some warnings. See, the other side of the scale is this. There's some, and, and Matthew 7 has the same thing. It's, it isn't just... Uh, whoever says they're a believer. And there's a biblical warning against unbiblical behavior and thoughts. And if someone persists in hopelessness, and I'm not talking about, you know, someone who, and, and I have done my fair share of suicide funerals, and uh, they are hard, very hard, especially when you know just where they sat in the congregation. And, and you just think back of all the times you, I'm just looking because I know where the different ones over the years in churches I've pastored would sit. And I can remember looking in their eyes for years. And, and what, what you see is that, that when believers commit suicide, usually it's not a lifetime of unbiblical behavior and thoughts. It's a sudden, it's almost like uh, any of you that ever go fishing and you have your inboard or outboard motor at full tilt and you totally throttle it back, you are in danger of having a wave come in to your boat. And, and that's usually what I see in Christian suicides is that, that all of a sudden the wave rolls in and it's so unlike their whole life. But for someone who has had a lifetime of unbiblical behavior and thoughts, who, who verbally, Matthew 7, 7, say, Lord, Lord, the Bible has a warning. We as believers are to examine ourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and be sure that we're really holding on to Christ by faith. 
Because there are some people that claim to be Christians that have never believed, acted, had biblical behavior and thoughts who commit suicide, and they just showed that they were hopeless and lost and a pagan and, and by that. But when it's paradoxical, then, then it's, it's uh, understandable. Now, truths to stand upon when you're around suicide. Yes, saints sometimes feel so badly that they want to die. For example, Elijah and David. Uh, David. David felt as hopeless and as far from God. He felt forsaken and abandoned by God. Uh, to some extent, uh, the apostle Paul did too. But Elijah especially said, now I want to die. I mean, and he was a, a mouthpiece of God. So that's the first thing. Yes, saints can sometimes feel they can just get to this point in that darkness that they don't want to go on living. Number two, it is sin to fulfill those dark thoughts by ending your life. It is. And, and now we're getting into the whole euthanasia thing. I mean, and that's where this whole thing is going because a lot of people say, is it morally justifiable if you're going to die and you have bone cancer and it's getting worse and worse and you can't hardly bear it? Is it morally justifiable to just, you know... Uh, do the Dr. Kevorkian thing, you know, and, and uh, the Hemlock Society, et cetera, et cetera. No, it's not morally justified. It's not. And, it, and it's always sin. And it's forgivable. And it has consequences. But it's always sin. The only way sins are forgiven, third truth, so the first one is yes, Christians can commit suicide. Yes, it's always sin. Now the third one is, the only way that sins are forgiven is through a relationship to Jesus Christ by faith. That's the only way. And so, sometimes saving faith can get so weak that our hearts give way to grievous sin. And there are examples of that all the way through the scriptures. And so, yes, it is possible um, for wonderful followers of Christ who are possessing saving faith uh, to become so weak that their hearts give up and they, for that period of time, are hopeless. So what, what is the implication of that? Well, Jesus said this, and see, I think that suicide, like any other uh, sin, needs to take us back to the, the doctrine of the work of God in salvation. Jesus weighs in on this. He said, truly I say unto you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter, utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of eternal sin. So what is that? What is blasphemy? Only one thing puts a person beyond forgiveness, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. But this is not any single act. See, a lot of people, th this is probably one of the most common questions, uh, especially when I uh, speak to college groups, uh, you know, and do uh, college retreats. Um, they, they think, did I just do? Well, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is not a single act. For Jesus says, any sins and blasphemies. You notice he says, any sins and blasphemies will be forgiven him who follow him. No, it's not a single act. It's not, you just did that, killed yourself, or, you know, went there, or did that, or whatever. Blasphemy against the Spirit of God is treating the Spirit as dirt by continually and persistently resisting and rejecting this call to repentance until death. So actually, everyone in hell will have blasphemed the Holy Spirit because the only way you can get to hell is persistently and continually to resist and reject the one who John 16 says came to convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And they say, no, 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 no. Of course, then there comes a time when they don't hear it, which always reminds me of um, uh, back when I was running around doing what I was talking about this morning, running Bibles into Morocco. I used to uh, visit one of the people that supported us when I was doing the, those missionary trips, and they owned a Barzona ranch. And if you are into cows, you know what Barzonas are. And I remember that uh, they were typical Texans. And uh, when I would visit them and report on the mission work, they'd take me out to see their ranch. They had 10,000 acres. That's 16 square miles of cows. 
and they grew oil wells too, by the way. Uh, but uh, they would show me their cows, and I'll never forget uh, uh, the mother wore a big hat and had hat pins, which have really long pins on them. And uh, she says, you want a good sermon illustration? I said, I'm always looking for good sermon illustrations. And this is in the 70s, which shows how good it is. I'll never forget it. This continually and persistently resisting leads to a hardening where you don't hear the Spirit of God. There's a point, there's a line a person can cross when they no longer feel the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And so this Texan uh, Barzona rancher pulled a pin as long as this uh, um, marker, or it looked that long to me, and she said, you want to see something? She walked up next to one of those at least 1,000 pounders, and she said, watch. And there was their triple bar whatever ranch, you know, uh, branded in the side of that Barzona, and it was out in their 10,000 acres of grasslands chewing away its cut or whatever it was doing. And she walked up to that thing, pulled her hat pin out, and went <coughs> and jammed that pin into the brand. The cow never stopped chewing. She said, it doesn't feel anything. It totally has lost its feeling because of the searing of the brand. There are people that remind me of Barzonas. They have continually, persistently resisted and rejected the Spirit's call to repentance until they die. And they never hear his voice again. So no single sin, not even suicide, evicts a person from heaven into hell. One thing does, and only one thing, continual rejection of God's Spirit. So what sort of momentary weakness, what brief cloud of hopelessness can cause someone to take their life remains a mystery. It is hard to believe that someone who knows the God of hope, who, who has the Spirit of God living within them, who has the light of the world living within them, can allow darkness to so overwhelm them. But no one can say this, that their final act is unforgivable. See, that's why the Roman Catholic Church has this extreme unction, you know, the final of the seven sacraments, which is extreme unction, which is, you know, putting the little uh, oil on the forehead kind of to, to get you ready to go to purgatory to purge those last sins from your final acts or whatever you missed. That's not in the Bible. What is in the Bible is Hebrews 10, 14, that by one sacrifice, Jesus even paid for our final acts and has forgiven them nor any other act by any of us. For Jesus said all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, if they give up resisting the Spirit and look to Jesus for salvation. So, is suicide morally justifiable? Absolutely not, under any circumstances. But is it forgivable? Absolutely.